And this welcome everyone like... who's joined us. <laughs> Hi. Oh yeah. Uh, for those of you, I I know like a lot of people here, so just hi, 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 dear people. I see like super dear faces. And um, uh, for those of you that I didn't have the pleasure to meet yet, um, my name is Bida, Bida Sacic. I'm showing my print. So these are from Penland um, from this summer. And like I was working on this project called 10 by 10, which are really narratives of 10 women um i was interested in women in the industry so i was like mining language uh taking words from uh women who were working in the textile industry in the area of balkans i'm from croatia originally and um i was like trying to find um language and words that spoke to their experience working in um just working in the textile industry anywhere from like 1947 through today and i was specifically interested in like textile industry sorry like let's see from far away and from close up i was specifically interested in textile industry because they are um there was a huge textile industry in, in balkans that developed after World War II. And uh, what happened was it basically died out through the period, through the period of privatization, through like um, after the civil war in Croatia. And so it was kind of, it was a social project, cultural social project, right? And I was setting all this metal type and I didn't have enough to reset 10 narratives. So I was kind of being a Penelope, like I would like, one day I would set all this type together and I would print and overprint one print. And then at the end of the day, I would just like take it apart and, um, you know, weave another story next day. So it was like kind of, it was like a mind space to be in, right? But I printed an edition of 10 each of the 10 prints. And I was trying to work a lot with technical issues, like just like, aligning type to where it would fall between the lines of type and adding you know specific spacing that would facilitate the storytelling um and they all kind of work together all the prints are like a part of the same series um so i will i plan to exhibit them together you know is this a successful way of showing them do you guys see what i'm showing yeah and if anybody doesn't know you can pin her video and make it bigger Oh, I like I like this one because it has a bunch of rule. So these are all like rule that I bent. They let me bend it. I would like to know that I was I did get approval to bend these rules um, and make this kind of like a shape. So some of these are quite overprinted, but I was trying to get that idea of an abstract composition that pulls you in, and then when you get closer to it, you really start to engage with the content. And I was really motivated because I felt like these were stories that these were stories that didn't I don't that weren't shared and should have been. So this one's actually like you could you can read it like this and you can read it like this too. So there's ten of these prints, um, and I was you know made in two weeks, um, just kind of trying to crank them out. I think I still have. A few more here. Um, and it, I was really happy with this project. I thought it was like an introductory project into my sabbatical. Great, you know, let's, I'm, you know, I'm working with the content I'm interested in. A part of this whole work has been an acquisition of materials from that area as well. So I was able to like acquire wood type from um, my hometown in Croatia, which has almost no wood type. Of, you know, left, there's, the printing industry has basically died out. Um, I was able to connect with a private printer, um, you know, an older gentleman who kind of passed on some of his wood type to me. And I was able to, in several trips, bring it over to the United States. I still have some over there, uh, but majority is now over here. And a really exciting thing about that acquisition was that it was wood type that was used for the textile uh, factory in my town. 
So some of these, you know, some of this work that I'm doing is also relating to the equipment that I'm able to procure. And that idea of the objects of printing being a part of the story, part of telling the story of a culture and story of a people and story of different peoples within that social order, I think is really, you know, it is really interesting to me. So that's kind of where my research um, went alongside with making this work. And, and that was really, yeah, I was like, okay, this is great. Next step, I want to go to the Balkans area and actually work with this equipment. So my plan was to, um, you know, travel in March as one does. Um, and in my case, I was going to go to a residency in Slovenia, which is um, the only place, Ljubljana in Slovenia is the only place that I know really has a, a like a, comparable facilities, um, Tipoteca Renaissance, uh, Tipoteca, um, ne, oh, I, uh, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to see if Marco's here. I actually invited them to be on this call, but I don't think they're here. They are here. Um, anyway, I was going to go work there. So, um, he, like, obviously the trip fell apart, um, and I wasn't able to to travel there, but I was still interested in continuing to work with this kind of idea of voice and storytelling and like kind of geographic area as well. Um, and I think, you know, I, for me, a big part of that has been like just in general reading books that, um, that inspired this work. I was really into reading Rebecca Solnit, like a couple of you know that I've been talking to, but, um, you know, this idea of like, I have I've even brought my Rebecca Solnit books, big plug for Rebecca Solnit, but this idea of like really thinking about, um, you know, what are like, how can we use language to tell stories of people that are not getting to speak and how can we facilitate um, communication of those whose voices often aren't heard and like, how can we maybe encourage people that have a difficulty speaking up, um, uh, you know, uh, to speak up. So, so it, it was a lot about about that kind of work. Um, so, and that's that's actually where these narratives come from. Um, so, since I didn't get to travel and I didn't get to go back to Ljubljana and work there, um, um, I actually have continued working here, but went back into like mining some of the language to. Um, to print. So I've been working on a collaborative project with um, artist uh, Kristen Abhalter-Smith, who's, who's joining us somewhere on this call. Shout out to Kristen. Um, but I have been, <laughs> she waved, um, but I have been um, mining Croatian fables. So I went back and looked at existing language um, in storytelling and like fables from that ge general geographic area and um, specifically been working with um, this fable of the shoemaker's apprentice, which is just a specific story for that area. Um, but I am interested in this particular story is like focusing on a protagonist who's a shoemaker apprentice. And he's actually a really great protagonist. I, I love this fable. Like growing up, I was really, you know, it was a fable that I would listen to before I go to bed every night. And my mom bought me a tape, like these were modern parents. My parents were modern parents. So no, they didn't like read to me. I'm a child of divorced parents. Uh, but they did buy me a tape and um, I, they would like, you know, I would play it like every night, Shoemaker's Apprentice. So I think I love that, I love that fable. And he was uh, like, the apprentice is kind of like an orphan oh, out in the big world. <laughs> and, um, one thing that I was interested in was the oh, yes. protagonist uh, has uh, an accomplice who's a circus oh, performer yes, and her name is Gita. So I was actually interested in shifting protagonists in the fable and um, looking at um, the circus performer uh, who has very interesting lines uh, in the play speaking about her abilities to perform in the circus and kind of using that language as a metaphor of um, like, you know, stepping out, um, even stepping out as an artist or stepping out as somebody in the public eye. 
So I've been printing not only the words from the fable, but rewriting it in the first voice um, and adding my own writing to it, which is also kind of inspired by some of the work that Rebecca Solnit, um, you know, has encouraged um, her readers to do and maybe some of the other more contemporary like feminist reading. But um, she like, I think that Gita serves kind of as, as a person to, you know, to in whose eye you can kind of like exercise your own, um, your own experience and your own like future ambitions or, or your own reality. So I've been printing on, I've actually been printing on fabric. Kristen who's here has, per, I mean, it's been great to work on a collaborative project during this time. So Kristen, who is here on the call, has procured this fantastic fabric, which is, um, it looks kind of like paper. Um, it's plasticky. It's maybe what you would wear as like a raincoat or something. I don't know. She can correct me later. I don't know what I'm talking about. Kristen is going to make clothes out of this. Um, it, but it's nylon. Just to, it's to nylon. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a nylon that's like a ripstop nylon but it's translucent which is a little bit hard to tell with the video but it's basically like almost it almost looks like a rice paper or something um but it's also like um yeah i mean it's it's not quite water impermeable it still has it has really thin fibers but yeah it's nylon <laughs> christian, christian do you, you work in fab oh yeah work oh you go first Tiff. No, you go first. I think you're going to ask the question I want to know. Okay. Chris, you've worked with it in the past in this fabric, right? And yeah. you've made, can you, in the project that you were making when I met you was the Air Dancers or is the Air Dancers, mm -hmm. right? Which is, can you just tell, like, uh, can you tell me just like about the Air Dancers? I want the people to know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I, I make um, inflatable sculptures that are based on those uh, sort of obnoxious creatures that you see next to uh, used car lots or cell phone stores. Um, only I, I, I build them out of materials that I find that aren't necessarily the same type of materials that they're usually made of. And this changes the way that they behave. And I've played with different shapes, um, some um, without any arms or legs. They're really just like tubes that move around. Basically, I made some that were gold, like iridescent gold, and they're holding hands with each other and they're, and they're dancing with each other. And um, this is one of the fabrics that I found in the creation of these features. And I've also started making garments that, that people can wear when they're interacting with the sculptures. And I made a, an installation, or actually it was a performance. I made some costumes for a performance where I used this fabric um, over layers of striped fabric and they were rain ponchos and the performance was outside um, in front of a flagpole and it actually rained that day even though we weren't expecting it to so I don't know, it made sense <laughs> but yeah thank you <laughs> yeah I think it's really important to note the collaborative nature of like your um of your project because that's what I was really drawn to too about collaborating with you is that you know you are you're a collaborator. I mean, you're also a gallery gallerist. So you're a collaborator. And I found it easier to work with a collaborator too. Um, because I felt I felt like, I don't know, it, I just had more fun and it worked for me, but I also highly recommend it. So I was so I started printing on the on like on the fabric and I, I do have my printing home printing set up here to show you fellow printing nerds. So there will be a press in this video, if you would like to see one although it is small, in case you are one of the people who thinks that size matters for presses, it, my press is not large. Um, sorry, Brad, I know, I see you. Yeah. 
but anyway, so I printed on this and like, and then I printed, I printed all of these, right? Like, so this is all the same fabric, but it's like, but it's wood type. So I am using, wait, how does this go? I am using the same typeface. Um, and part of that is because I am at home now. So I have a studio um, with a Vandercook 4 and like all of my type and my Croatian type and stuff in it. But the problem is that I share a bathroom space in that studio. So I do not want to go work there. I am working at home. I can go and pick up stuff, but I can't, I don't really want to spend a long time there because it feels weird and I just am more comfortable at home. So what I did was I actually brought um, a small press home. It's a sign press. And that press is really dear to me because it belonged to a friend, um, Pamela Olson, who was also a resident at Hamilton. And then she got it from, um, I forgot, I think she got it. I forgot where she got it, but somehow it came from Theaster Gates, who's like a, a, a great artist here in my city of Chicago where I am. So it's, it's a press with great history and I really love it. Um, and I have basically used it here um, to print this work. And then also I am printing like paper, still printing on paper, but like it's not, it's not really working out right now. I can show you my bad paper prints and they're not where I want them to be. Um, so yeah, so this is like some of the stuff that I'm printing. So some of this language that I'm showing is, um, actually, I think a lot of it is mine. Um, it might have like a little bit of a Gita in it, or like it might be using that character as a character that is helping like me perform. But I think that in overall, it is a care, it is, um, something that I eventually have, you know, composed and, and, and written through working with Kristen, who's like been working with me on it. So Kristen and I are gonna stitch all this up and I already have a pair of pants that she printed on, which I will also show you because they are funny. But I don't have them right now here. Um, so, so that's like the, 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 exactly what I'm doing at the moment. I can show you the small press that I'm using. So here's the here's the kitchen table, dining room table set up. It has this beautiful make ready on it that's still on there. It's, I really like that. I don't have furniture here, so I'm using magnets. And this is the wood type that was used to print the um, the words that I was showing earlier. Um, so I have been locking it up using magnets into the press bed. And I have my whole setup here, including a very large can of ink <laughs> because I'm ambitious like that. Or maybe I'm actually a pessimist if I have such a big can of ink here. But um, I also have been thinking about, you know, I've also used like just like little burnisher for stuff as well, which has been uh, working pretty well. Um, let's see, what else? I have my textured plates here too. I sometimes, a lot of the time, in addition to wood type, I will make my own plates. So one like really inexpensive way that I've been doing that, that's really simple, is just by using a lino plate or reusing a lino plate that I carved. Sometimes they're carved on the back and then just building up form using cardboard and duct tape in this case. That way I can reuse it indefinitely and it creates like a textured pattern so I've been doing that a lot for my relief prints. And then I'm also using um, plates on my prints that are uh, cuts, you know, like I really like abstract cuts. So I have a whole array like set up. I have tons of these that I've been using um, just to create my abstract prints alongside my words. I have some, I have some. So these have been like just things that I'm messing around in my free time. I'm really, I've been, we're doing a lot of work with gestures. Um, 
as inspired by a book by uh, Bruno Munari about speaking Italian. I um, actually have it over here. So this is the book that inspired some of my work with gestures. Um, it is about the art of communicating with your hands. And I have been making also sculptural work that is inspired by this, but I'm, I'm trying to translate it into print. So this is a failure, <laughs> failure. Um, let's see. That's kind of like what I have been working on mostly. I feel like um, I'm, I'm very excited to see the work with Kristen come together. And I will, I, I wanna show you some of the, um, I have a pair of pants that we, that I really wanna show you before we sign off. So that'll be kind of like the last thing maybe, if you're interested. That'll be like dessert. That'll be like, yeah, that's the best part. Pants <laughs> coming. Yeah. Yeah. I loved your like baseline because you're using the magnets instead of furniture. It, it, you can see it affecting your work, which I think is kind of beautiful. It's been good. It's, I mean, it's interesting to experiment with. Frankly, I have only had the press here for a few days. So I have, I hope that I can push it further than just kind of fun stuff for now. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also, like the thing that I've been really happy about lately is yesterday I got my star-shaped press prints in the mail because I got my paycheck. So I was like, nothing's gonna cheer me up except buying some letterpress work. So I bought something from Joe and I brought those like really great prints from Jen. Oh my God, I love these so much. So I bought the whole set of the ladies prints from Jen Farrell that are like, they're even better in person. I was so excited to get them. And I saw that David Wolski had his hand up. Do you have a question, Mr. Wolski? I do have a question. Um, Vita, you used the word failure to describe that uh, print that you held up. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you define success or failure relative to the work that you're doing now? So I was, um, I, I really am thinking about failure as a step towards getting to a better, you know, to getting somewhere. So on a personal level, I am, on a personal level, I'm less concerned with failure, but it, I am not comfortable with it publicly. So to show work that I feel like is work that's in process and that work that is personal, I think I always feel like I need to get, put that disclaimer on it. So, um, and I, I feel really, I, have, I actually feel like super petrified even doing this <laughs> because it is, um, you know, because I think that a lot of people here are technical experts and people I admire and I find, and I'm concerned that they will um, think of me less if I show them work that's in progress. So for me, like to get that kind of, to put that label on it is a way of protecting myself. But I also simultaneously realize now when I'm talking about it, that it's too strong of a label because it also could dismiss me immediately. So it is that I think almost that self-protective layer is doing what I don't want to happen preemptively. Um, and I think that that's, that's you know, something that, um, that is, that I think that's challenging, especially for people um, that don't have as much practice with assertion, you know, with, with an assertion of con their consciousness over other consciousnesses. And I think that that's, I don't know, is that like super, we'll skip, are you, am I okay here? Yeah, yeah. It's just, um, I, I, I talk a lot with my students about defining success um, relative to the objectives of whatever it is that they're working on. And so I was, I was just curious if there, if you have, um, 
predetermined objectives for the work and that's how you're you're gauging against that um, when you use a word like failure like are you more interested in why i think it's bad or like just kind of how, um, how, I'm, how i'm talking or how i'm talking about failure Vita, I think he's yeah, I, I think it's, I'm just more interested in. It's 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 more about um, like when you when you say that something is a failure, that implies that uh, you have an idea of what success looks like, um, and I'm just curious what what that might be. In relative to this work, I think non non goopy. You know, for the particular print that I showed, it was like the, it was in process because it had goopy ink coverage, for instance. So technically, I felt like not finished, not good enough. Technically, um, you know, compositionally could be pushed further. Um, so it, a lot of it is, is is that kind of stuff but in in of its existence as the fact that i have made something and that i've made something as a step to the next thing and that i was not afraid to make it like messy in that sense it was a step towards what i would share publicly so it's that's why that's why it's in process um and and I, I yeah, I, I feel strongly about that. Like it wasn't technically as good and as finished as I would um, as I would want it to be. For instance, even when I, even these these prints, although they seem simple, they're the ink coverage is really controlled, for instance. So it's like it's uneven sometimes, and the spacing is uneven sometimes, but it's controlled. Mm -hmm. So I think that 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 makes it there by choice. Occasionally, there will be like ink on the edges of them but i wanted them to be visible as printed pieces so that made them really that made them successful you know but there's no like stains or like a big fingerprint because this time i didn't want them if there was if but i'm not excluding the possibility of sometimes wanting them i think that there is some interesting work out there that kind of pushes this idea of what shows off technical expertise and what doesn't like i think that kind of deliberateness is really important but like the whole like you know the whole failure thing i think in you know, i think it's just so important to be okay to say that you're failing or to be vulnerable so and sometimes i think i exercise that a lot um i just think it's so important to be okay with that and like and maybe retain your sense of humor even more than your sense of control because i think ultimately there is more power in that or not it's not even like a power issue it's like a it it just seems like more humane i think or i'm watching too much Brene brown you know well i i definitely think that um it's it's important to to be vulnerable especially uh as an educator and that's that's really what I was was interested in is um, I'm sure the there are certain aspects of the print that you just did that could be defined as successful um, you know it's successful as an experiment successful as a, a step in the process that led you towards what your um, idealized outcome might be yeah i think I, I i agree with that because i think it is a label it's ultimately a label it's you know that that one affixes on it but i th but it's kind of interesting to present your work and swim between those tides i think there's something really interesting about that and, and about like like you're almost kind of messing around with the audience and see if they like if they're interested or not and you know something you'll lose people but i think that that's that's just what happens anyway i don't think you can make people i don't know i don't think it's interesting to make people think that your work is good <laughs> you know like okay so that's why 
I think uh, there are specific things I could discuss about that print that I liked, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it go for now. I also find it very tough to have this giant stack of work that I knew I had to make to get to those final prints, but I also don't find good enough to share or show or, and then I go, what do I do with all this work? You know, that isn't work, but it had to be made. Like I had, I had to get it out of my system and I had to get it out. Um, so that's always been an interesting thing for me. And I know we can only make so many postcards, uh, make ready notebooks and, uh, you know, so that's been also my like, oh, okay, now I have this interesting stack of, of paper um, to figure out what to do with that. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's, that's really a good point. I'm super interested in what people do like, do they like, you know, does anybody else like, mm -hmm. what do you do with your prints that you don't end up thinking are good enough to show or sell or whatever? Collage. Mm, that's a good one. Anybody else? I'm trying um, to see who's on this. I've, I've been cutting up or uh, taking my make readies and printing something new on top of it. Mm -hmm. So those things that, you know, sometimes I could call them a failure, but, you know, usually it's because like the in is upside down or something like that. And uh, those get layers and layers and layers and eventually I have nothing to do with it. So, um, while I have these huge stacks, I want to continue to use them. So like when you talk about failure, I don't think it really comes into play, but it, it does um, allow me to start to think about what a new print can look like, whether it's like two colors sitting on top of each other um, that informs, you know, maybe something a year down the line. Yeah. Those like happy accidents. Right. <laughs> Do you I, cut them out and keep them or do you, sorry, David, I just like, or is it just, you like might have a stack that you go through later? Um, I think like when I find a good one, cause I'm always using and reusing and reusing them. Um, if I see a little moment on it, I'll just set it aside for the time being and maybe it'll just be in my periphery or in my <laughs> workspace for a little while. <laughs> hey, pop. Yeah, and, sorry. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, may, maybe it doesn't become anything, but it it might. Um, I usually cut mine up and turn them into postcards and send them to people I like or don't even know. <laughs> I found myself um, doing much the same thing like it's the hardest part of it is knowing when to call a printed piece of paper a piece of uh, recycling or you know like something to throw away that's the hardest part like conceptually it could have so many sorry it could have so many different uses until you decide to trash it that ultimately it's like a collage, it's a postcard, it's everything. I've started printing on um, on uh, bum wad and tissue paper to make collages even easier. And now I'm making even more trash. So. I have I to think say. It's, I think it's a, a great opportunity to use those. Um, at the book arts program, we, we would do mail art. Uh, so you could start a, a long distance collaboration with somebody by sending them something that you're not interested in working on at the stage that it's at, but it might prompt someone else to um, make something really exciting with it. We should do one amongst a bunch of us. We should do some exchanges like you know, random envelopes that go to Hamilton and then maybe redistribute it out of that. That could be fun. I like that. We can make it happen. Yeah, yeah. I'm down. Yeah, I, I've been getting back into mail art for sure. Like, I've, I've made four books since we quarantined. Um, just like much more physical objects and then sending them out to people and stuff just because it's, it's the form of... I, social isolation is one thing but 
not having content come into your life as often, like buying those prints from Jan, I totally agree. Like I've been trying to get hold of some things now that like, I'm like, oh, there's a handful of books that I really need. Oh, there's a handful of films that I want to buy. You know, like it's now it's a time to kind of hunker down with all the things that you want to be around. And also, um, when the mailman shows up, I, my mailman's actually like the grumpiest, potentially racist person ever, but I'm still happy to see him. <laughs> you know. Well, some of our students um, in the, from the type shop at SAIC, um, when they throw away their proofs or prints at the end of the semester, um, there's another teacher, he teaches, um, they do a lot of collage in their class and he asked me if um, they could have all the, <laughs> the, all the stuff that people threw away. And so um, for a while I was giving them to him and he was super happy. <laughs> One of the genius things that uh, Hatch does is, uh, at least when I was um, there as a visiting artist, uh, Jim Sheradden always had a, a make ready by the press that he cleaned the knives onto. And um, after it had built up hundreds of layers they would uh, print the Hatch logo on it and sell it as a unique piece of art. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, as many of you know, I'm a volunteer at Hamilton. And one of the things I've done during the last year is spend a lot of my time making postcards that they sell in the store. And um, uh, strictly speaking, I suppose these aren't uh, I've made some what are not really make readies, uh, but rather I, I printed twice on the same card. And uh, as I'm holding up here, uh, uh, um, I print the, uh, uh, the postcards four up on 11 by 17. And uh, I printed, uh, printed them twice with two different sets of letters. And I get some sort of nice effects. And if I have something I like, um, I'll cut it into a five by seven print and you know, put it uh, with my collection. Those are great, Larry. Yeah, those are beautiful. Yeah, those, are, those are gorgeous. Sometimes when I'm in a hurry and need a surface uh, to get some ink on a proof real quick, I'll use my coated stock as my, instead of a piece of glass, I'll grab it and use it to, to get ink on, onto my type and all that stuff. So it's kind of a quick and fast and it's already going to generally go in the trash. So it at least gets a few more uses out of it. We also sell our make ready in the shop too. A lot of people buy it for collaging. We've been using uh, coated paper. We do ink and drinks, which are like Friday night events. So it's only two to three hours. And we've been using coated paper in place of glass because it's so much easier on cleanup. Loved it. It's been amazing. It's been quicker. It takes less time. Um, so that's been really nice. Some of those are actually lovely or the way that people clean up when they clean up their rag goes off the edge and then makes like a really soft painterly uh, abstract shape. I save those. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but I love them. They're beautiful and they're so unintended, which is kind of nice as well. I'm still stuck on the idea that you guys are drinking for three hours. Yeah, <laughs> it's Wisconsin. If you can't do it for three hours. Wow. <laughs> I'll be honest, there isn't a lot. Only of three hours. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, you guys know how much work printing takes. And so I feel like the ink and drinks, the inking has been the thing that gets them in the door. They're like, oh, I can drink. Maybe I can print. And then they have the printing and go. Like what we always do is we, we get these lovely women who have never thought about letterpress printing in their life. And they do like a girl's night out. And so then they do it. And I love it because they'll go, 
well, I thought three hours would be way too long here. And they go, I, we could stay for four more. And I'm like, yes, I know. <laughs> so it's a, it's fun to get a different group of people in who would never try letterpress printing, but they see inking or they see drinking attached to it. And then they're right, it's right up their path. So, so next, next you should uh, start up a, a drink and clean event. Yes. <laughs> we should. <laughs> That's exactly what we should do. Uh, yeah, we still have um, uh, cases and cases of wood type. If anyone would like, when you can finally come to Hamilton, let me know. You can help clean a uh, wood type that hasn't seen the light of day for about 25 to 50 years. Which Paul Pignato, our collections manager, is on this call. Uh, so he might be here at that point too. You could help him. Uh, yes, I always like help with that. Thank you. I'm the one responsible for cleaning up the, uh, the workshop after the drink and eat. And I love that idea of a drink and clean. <laughs> It'll be sponsored by Larry. <laughs> right. I have to admit, it's very funny. I'm so glad we've all you, uh, learned to use our mute, but it makes it very awkward when you think you've said something funny and then it is silent. <laughs> <laughs> That's my life story. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know you were on the call. Hi, Jason. In case anyone hasn't figured this out, I've had to use Zoom quite a bit. So I learned that if you uh, hold the space bar down on your keyboard, it will temporarily unmute you. And then when you release the, the space oh, bar, then you go back to mute. Clever. Thanks, David. Oh. I'm going to do that all the time now. Oh, good. That doesn't work on my Chromebook, so. That is a power user tip. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Unless, of course, you have your cursor in the chat, then it just puts spaces in the chat, just so you know. That's exactly what just happened to me. I was like, why is this not working? I'm like, wait a minute. There's a cursor dancing over here. OK. Yes. So oh, this is there. Hey, I've got a question. Has anyone ever considered using the 3D printers to make type or plates or something? I got some 3D printed type. It's, it's OK. It's. Um, yeah. You know, if, if you're going big, then you have this great opportunity to, to sand it down and to make it into like sort of the form that you want it to be. But then if you make it big, the cost of the material to make it sturdy enough to be pressure worthy is really, um, it's really prohibitive. So you sort of have to find that really perfect size. I think 10 and 12 line is kind of like the perfect size to to make um, 3D type. And when Jason and I are hosting, I can share with you some of that. I, Jay, are we gonna do like a co-hosting thing? Is that what we wanna do? Like two, two days of you and me both or just what? I don't know. Yeah, we're gonna have to come figure that out, Rick. Okay, yeah, yeah let's do this offline. <laughs> we haven't, we haven't figured it out yet, but I'm down with uh, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I, I got some stuff I can share. My, my favorite thing to make plates out of right now is, is cardboard. Um, thicker the better, so to speak. I know Dan Elliott does that at ECU. He's got a really great system around that. Even though he's also got a laser, he kind of moves to cardboard early in the game just to try and solve the challenge. Um, and I've been experimenting with bases. The bases are actually the hardest part. Like bases tend to be some of the most tricky stuff because they they all want to move, they all want to warp, they all want to be not even. You know, mm. there's this um, there's this aluminum sandwiched corian that is actually really nice because it's it wants to stay flat on top. Anyone else got some bases ideas? Yeah, two things. Uh, MDF is always great, but uh, there's a aluminum cast aluminum stuff called tool and jig plate. I'll put that in the chat as well. But it's a precision machine and it's available in about any thickness you could want. But it's uh, about as accurate as a boxcar base. 
Yeah. I, I use particle board and that seems to be fine for whatever, whatever surface I'm printing from. Those uh, rainbow prints that I just did, that was um, chipboard that was mounted to type high. What about gator board? Is that too soft? I think it's corrugated. Is that true? I, I don't know what it's made out of, but it seems to be very stiff and hard, unlike foam core. I, it's I love fluted. That. I don't think it's corrugated. Um, it's fluted, though. Like it has, it's like cardboard in that it has air in the middle. Yeah. Uh, Sintra board, uh, that's a really amazing surface to print from. Super smooth. Um, so it, accepts ink really well but soft enough that you can carve or cut or draw directly onto it cool and i've put plexi mounted on like a three-quarter ply board and that's given me a really nice even surface as well just super 77 plexi on top of a ply board My challenge isn't how to make a play. My challenge is to make a play in a play. So I'm echoing. Um, but it's, it's how to make it in a sustainable way that doesn't destroy it if I don't want it destroyed or can destroy it if I want it destroyed or, you know, the bases, like sometimes you can't get solvents on those bases. The challenge for me is like, uh, also with the method that I want to make the mark, you know, if I want to make a mark that feels very human, um, some of these plate making technologies that I've designed with the laser and all this stuff, they're just sort of useless. I have to throw my hands in the air and be like, I got to make a drawing, then I got to scan it, then I got to cut it, I, you know. So ultimately, I'm always seeking these much more humanistic ways of making marks as a plate in reverse to the, you know like uh you know so cardboard is as close as i've ever gotten to like being able to just be somewhat nimble with it all and then just flip it over right just flip it over and it's reversed and you're, you're good to go I, I totally agree with what Rick just said. As somebody who uses a laser cutter all the time, um, getting to just take an X-Acto knife and cut a piece of chipboard and print it right away is very satisfying. And the way that, you know, the, the texture from it um, can vary as much as you want it to, which is really fun to play with as well. The other thing that I figured out what to do was um, when I've got the time, when you've got to put small type on a poster, I just use, I use my laser printer upstairs as, as the small type, but I set up the poster downstairs on the letterpress, print the letterpress, and then work around it for the laser printer, and then print the laser printer on the sheets first then go back downstairs <laughs> go back downstairs and then letterpress print uh the big stuff and it's been one of those like i i felt like i was really got i saved a lot of energy because solving small type when you really don't want to go below 24 or 36 point solving that is really difficult During uh, Daffy's summer workshops, one of the exercises that he's having students do um, is uh, make printing surfaces using chipboard. And you can cut it with scissors or knife, um, but you can also modify the surface um, through all kinds of processes. Um, you can bend it, you can sand it, you can score it. 
can uh, actually glue um, other things to it. So it's a pretty malleable way to make plates. Mm -hmm. I did Sorry. the same thing in the workshop with Daffy. Like I did, we did the same thing where we actually made type out of cardboard, I think, and it was ripped so that it would have like, a kind of a pattern like a edge to it that's specific and then it was covered with um i think i think we just covered it with like glue to to make it resistant um so we could reuse it but i you know i cover my cardboard with um duct tape because i like that little pattern on it and actually i think with the last three minutes do you want to show us your your pants Yes. Letterpress pants. <laughs> I've never got to ask that question before. Please show us your pants. Oh yeah. Sorry. So that they were in my dresser. Sorry. Okay. I wish I was wearing them. <laughs> I'll wear my pants over my actual pants because they are sheer. But. I don't know. Am I doing them justice? Probably not. These are so cool because they look like long johns. I don't know. I'm going to put them on. <laughs> In the oh old country, we call them knickers. This is, the part <laughs> where I don't, this is the part where I don't fit in the pants because, I, because I've been in a quarantine for so long. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Okay, I'm modeling my pants. This is it. This is not a failure. This is not a failure. <laughs> okay. Those mm. are the pants. <laughs> I'll make it a meme later. Thank you. We are Can you also include sound? Like, this is not a failure. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, it has like, it has words about movement on it and stuff. I like that one. I think they're yeah. beautiful. Really beautiful. Aren't they cool? Really cool, Vida. The construction it's is so fantastic. Christian. Really nice construction. And I worked in fashion. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 